Uh, hi everyone. Um, I think most of you know me. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow at the Open University and one of the GoGN coordinators. Um, very pleased to be talking to you today about the GoGN Conceptual Frameworks Guide. Um, the guide is now released on the website, it's live, um, and this webinar is going to be a kind of a brief introduction uh, to accompany it, um, but also a chance to acknowledge people's work uh, and contributions and uh, also a bit of a space for some reflection and discussion too. So here we go. Now uh, let's see. So um, what I'm going to be uh, covering today, uh, first of all, a bit about GoGN and background information, then um, a bit of an overview of uh, how the conceptual frameworks uh, guide came about and um, some of the ideas behind it. Um, then I'm gonna talk a bit about the presentation and the style that we went for. Um, and then I'm gonna go through basically what's in the, in the guide itself. Um, so talking through some of the different perspectives that we explore and um, going into some of the ideas around um, what the point of a conceptual framework is and how it can add value to research activity. Um, and then I'm going to just give an overview of the, what's, what the rest of the guide is about, which is, if you like, the overview of all the different conceptual frameworks that we discuss. And that is the area where most of the contributions from GoGN members are. So I'm not really going to go through those in a lot of detail um, in today's session because it's more, um, there's more value, I think, in just reading those sections for yourself. Um, then I'm going to talk at the end um, just a bit about what's what's planned for this and other GoGM publications. And then at the end, there's a bit of uh, time set aside for some discussion and critical reflection. So um, just a bit on GoGN uh, for anyone who's not familiar or if you're watching this uh, recording later. Uh, GoGN is the Global OER Graduate Network. And we are a network of support for uh, graduate students and increasingly postgraduate researchers working in the field of open education uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, we've been going since about 2013 and uh, the uh, network is currently hosted at the Open University in the UK. Uh, GoGN has three main aims. To raise the profile of research into open education. Uh, to offer support for people conducting uh, PhD and uh, any doctoral research in this area, and also to develop and explore openness as a process of research. And we have um, about 300 members altogether. So that lets us do exciting projects like this conceptual frameworks guide. So um, why did we focus on this? So you might remember last year we did the research methods handbook and this was very much in response to demand from members who were kind of looking for guidance around methods, methodology and um, not always feeling like they were getting that from their home institution um, and not always feeling like they were experts at their institution who could advise them on specifically sort of open approaches. Um, now this was quite well received last year and um, at the time we had this um, notion of doing a, a companion volume which was which would be more focused on theoretical perspectives and um, this idea um, continued to kind of take shape um, after we published the research methods handbook and so we, we went ahead with it this year and uh, followed a quite a similar process. So uh, we put out a call, we did a bit of a survey of members and asked people to tell us, how did you understand conceptual frameworks when you were um, writing your doctoral research? How do you see it now? What kind of uh, frameworks do you focus on and use? What do you find helpful and, and less helpful about them? Um, and all of that kind of data went into um, our planning process and uh, we also did some desk research and looked uh, just for, for what the cutting edge advice was around this, both in an open context and outside of that. So the Conceptual Frameworks Guide um, was written collaboratively 
written with contributions from 20 researchers. And the idea is that it provides an overview of perspectives on how to understand conceptual frameworks and what their role in research is. Uh, and so we've got a similar thing with the research methods where we also bring in those perspectives from researchers within the network, um, sharing their ideas about you know, best practice in this area. Um, and you can find the guide along with the other project outputs on the GoGN website. Um, I just wanna say briefly something about the style. Um, so again, looking back at the research methods um, handbook, uh, we had this kind of quite accessible style with the uh, cartoon illustrations and the penguins, but we'd kind of sneak in some complex, you know, stuff and some theory. Um, so for, for example, here, you've got the, the iceberg of method where um, the actual techniques you're using are just the tip of the iceberg and all, the, all this other stuff to kind of consider around it. Um, similarly here, you've got this kind of spectrum of metaphysical positions uh, re relative to science and the kind of um, different methods associated with different parts of that. Um, and we re also redrew some other people's um, uh, graphics and tables and that kind of thing to do it in this style. And this was considered um, a good thing. This was considered um, quite helpful to people understanding and, and sharing um, and also maybe taking some of the sting out of this stuff and it can be quite dry. Um, if you do want to go further into the visual style, there's this paper by myself and Brian, the artist, um, which you can look up and you can see some of the rationale there. Um, for the conceptual frameworks, we wanted to sort of build on that a bit. Um, and so we had a few different sessions, brainstorming things and um, working through different ideas and ways to present this stuff because the conceptual framework stuff is not as well, the paths aren't as well trodden as research methods. Um, and there's sort of less, there's, you're starting from a sort of um, less certain place, I would say, with conceptual frameworks, and we'll get onto that in a bit. But what we settled on was this idea of um, conceptual frameworks being a bit like vehicles that take you to your destination. And there can be sort of lots of different ways for that to happen, right? There's lots of different kinds of modes of transportation. Some of them are better suited to some terrains than others. And um, people also customize their cars. They do things to them to make them kind of unique or particular to them. Um, and so this all sort of comes together with this idea of wacky races or, or a gumball rally, or, you know, the idea of, um, you know, you having to sort of get to your destination via, you know, any, any sort of means you can with your vehicle, um, carefully chosen for your particular route so other people might not choose the same route as you um, but you're all trying to do something like a similar journey which is to kind of get to the end of that doctoral process. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just take you through um, some of the kind of desk research side of the uh, guide and um, just look at sort of the narrative that's in there about conceptual frameworks. Um, it's not that simple how it all fits together, <laughs> to be honest, because one of the things about conceptual frameworks compared to theories, for instance, is that it's a much more flexible term and people use it a bit more loosely. And the idea of a conceptual framework can be quite different in different um, disciplines and fields. So just bear that in mind that we're not trying to kind of be very prescriptive about how this all works. But at the same time, we're trying to help you sort of digest it and understand it a bit better. So um, if you start off with the sort of problem statement around conceptual frameworks, um, a lot of the time it comes down to uh, ambiguity about the difference between a theory, a theoretical framework or a conceptual framework and the work that those different concepts are doing within a piece of research. And um, I've taken the quote from Kivunja here, but there were, you know, very similar narratives in most of the papers that uh, we looked at. And essentially it comes down to um, uh, a lack of clarity um, and this having sort of consequences further down the line. So you see this table here um, we, from Lesham and Trafford's uh, paper. Um, and you can see that um, 
while it's not always obvious when there's a, an issue with a conceptual framework, it kind of comes out somewhere. And um, there's a list on the next slide um, from uh, Casanave and Lee. And they, they've got a kind of top 10 of problems that you can have with um, your conceptual or theoretical framing in your uh, research. Um, maybe this could be condensed down, maybe some of them are kind of overlapping a bit, um, but you might have no framework, right? Which in, in their idea, it, that equates to having no theoretical or conceptual assumptions um, at all in a study, which, you know, maybe a little bit harsh because a framework, you know, isn't something that, for instance, is, is, is expected in everyone's PhD, there isn't always a conceptual framework chapter. Um, it's common, um, but it's only kind of recently that it's become something where there's more interest, I would say. Um, sometimes a, a framework might be implied, but in some cases, yeah, there's gonna be no framework, one that's inappropriately chosen, one that doesn't really match up to the data that you're collecting. So you've got a framework that sets the, sets the scene or you know, brings an idea up, but then the data you're collecting just doesn't really relate to that. Um, it's also possible to sort of misapply a framework. So you think you understand it, but you don't really. So you end up doing something kind of superficial. Um, on in the same vein, um, you might mis misinterpret a theory. Uh, you rely on the sort of Cliff Notes version of something uh, rather than reading the primary text and you think you understand it, but you don't. Um, you might pay lip service to uh, Professor Famous, some big names, um, using their big ideas because you think it's, you know, the latest thing or whatever, and so on. Um, the idea here is that there's always something missing if you don't get the conceptual framework side of it right. But that's not to say there aren't sort of, you know, solutions to all these things. Um, the most concise definition that I found um, for what a conceptual framework actually is um, is this uh, list from uh, Ravitch and Riggan, uh, personal interests and goals, social location and positionality, topical research, sorry I've got the uh, chat box over my thing, topical research and theoretical frameworks. Um, this is not a bad list for what a conceptual framework looks like, because it's not just the same thing as the theories that are in your literature review, um, and a kind of synthesis of those and say, right, that's my conceptual framework, you know, done. Um, so this idea of positionality and personal interest and what's going on in the, in the world around you, um, I would say that this is partly what distinguishes a conceptual framework from a theoretical framework. It's also worth saying, um, uh, if you read to the end of this quote at the top, um, we never actually say in a piece of research, this is my conceptual framework, my personal interests are this, and my social location is this, and I've been reading this in the news, and so on. Um, so it's something that's kind of like under the surface, uh, but we, when we present that, um, they say it's, you know, as an argument. Um, I would say you have to present it sort of formally and according to a certain kind of um, idea of uh, what a proper conceptual framework looks like. Um, but I think the point here is that it's not the same thing as a theory. It's more flexible. Um, and it's often a way to um, bring together lots of different bits that are relevant to a, a, a particular research context or a particular project. Um, and not all of that is necessarily research, especially in education. Um, I think it's also worth saying that because there's that flexibility and that sort of plasticity to it, there aren't really sort of hard and fast rules about how to do it. Um, and, and actually, there's not very much published about it either um, in terms of, you know, the importance of conceptual frameworks for research. I think also um, there's got to be a sort of pragmatic aspect to this, right? The conceptual framework is essentially it's a kind of a, a tool that's going to be doing a job for you. And if it's not doing that job, so for instance, if it's making you more confused than if you don't have a conceptual framework, then it's probably not the right one. So um, I th there's the tendency as well to try and almost have a universal perspective on things and to say like everything's in my conceptual framework. Um, maybe that's too much stuff, right? Because it's not necessarily capturing everything. It, you want something that captures the right stuff, the most relevant stuff, and it actually helps you. So that said, um, 
I'm going to put the idea out there that there's basically two approaches to conceptual frameworks, um, not intending to oversimplify it. The first one um, is the idea that a conceptual framework is the overall organizing principle for a piece of research. So it's the, um, if you like, it's the meta um, of how you think about what you're doing in your practice. And um, the alternative way of seeing it is a conceptual framework is just one part of this mesh of different constructs that are used in research. Um, and so theories would be another, another kind of construct or models would be another kind of construct. And each of those has a sort of very specific and technical um, definition. Um, they're not fundamentally incompatible, right? It's possible to combine both of these ideas. Um, but this is where I found the most sort of meaningful distinction could be made um, when looking at sort of types of conceptual framework. And it's more how you use it as well, really. Um, it's quite abstract and it's sometimes quite difficult to sort of get the meta level right. And um, what you often find is that people go and rely on sort of metaphors about conceptual frameworks. Um, and so this is taken from a list on in Lesham and Trafford's paper, but they identify three basic types. And you've probably heard people talk about their work in these ways, you know, I've got this kind of scaffold or whatever that I'm building around. I'm trying to bridge these two concepts. I'm trying to make a map of these ideas um, and so on. Um, this is not um, a bad thing, right? But the risk with these sorts of metaphors is that you can end up too deep in the metaphor and you actually forget that this is supposed to be a tool and it was never literal anyway, right? It was just a way of trying to think about it that made sense. Um, I think that's kind of worth uh, pointing out. So um, thinking of the type one conceptual framework and how it might um, work, might, might fit together, what you can see here is that the conceptual framework, which is in the top right, is the, the thing that everything else feeds into. So um, on one branch, you've got this kind of uh, personal interest, topical research, you know, what's, what's going on in the news or whatever, current affairs, things that you find interesting, interactions that you have. Um, you've also got on the other side, the more sort of um, academic, formal, theoretical side of it. Um, and the idea is that these two things kind of come together and the, that sort of synthesis is managed by your conceptual framework. So it's the thing that draws it all together rather than just being a purely sort of theoretical side. Um, I think this is quite an interesting idea because it gets, it gets you to think a bit more about what sort of assumptions are you bringing to um, something like a conceptual framework. Uh, there are probably all kinds of things going on that you're not really thinking about or uh, aware of. Um, and probably the conceptual framework itself is something that itself is a bit sort of subterranean that you don't necessarily have it foregrounded. Um, and you might only write a couple of lines about it if you're writing something up and say, yeah, the conceptual framework is this. Um, but that seems to downplay this idea that you, it can be the organizing principle that everything else is kind of base, is based around, or at least it's the thing that emerges when you put everything else together. So that's one way of thinking about the different elements that kind of um, come together in a conceptual framework. The other idea um, is that there's more, it's more like there's um, a series of different constructs and a conceptual framework is one of those. So um, in Passy's list, for instance, um, a model has a specific definition um, and it's something that rises from a particular case or case, you know, cases. Um, and then you abstract from that and try to understand those, you know, the drivers or whatever that are going on. Um, a conceptual framework is more about identifying uh, factors that have influence in a particular field um, by looking almost um, not just at the kind of the theories, but also at um, factors that you might find that aren't theoretical necessarily or um, 
things that just have an influence on what's going on. And some of those could be, you know, political or whatever, or, you know, institutional and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of the time, though, that is what determines priorities for why research gets done in a particular area or not. Um, and when it comes to a theoretical framework or a theory, this is more like the kind of, you know, the technical definition. So like the theory of evolution is a theory, um, not because it hasn't been proven, but because um, that's what, you know, a theory is technically. Um, so th these are kind of different levels of abstraction and different levels of uh, flexibility and um, conciseness, I suppose. Um, and so what Passy says is that when you have a kind of good link between different constructs, um, you'll have a more sound uh, methodology and a more sound epistemology because each of these um, areas is, is doing something, is contributing to the overall kind of consistency and um, uh, sense of your research. And so um, there's a couple of examples in the paper, um, but what they, um, what Passy does is basically say, look, here's some of the kinds of things that align to these different constructs, and they're not all the same. They're not all just conceptual frameworks. They're all, um, they have specific uh, qualities and specific claims associated with them. Um, there's also uh, another, another paper, another table in that paper, which gives you a kind of breakdown of um, the different ontological and epistemological commitments of different um, constructs, which is quite uh, quite useful, I think. So um, one of the ideas in Passy's paper is that there's four basic ways of using theories in research, and so we've um, we've kind of elaborated that and, and redrawn it into this diagram. So one way is theories get used is as a tool. And so at the different points in the research process, that conceptual framework can be a tool for helping you to uh, understand and sort of uh, realign what you're doing. Um, there's the idea of um, it being an organizing principle. And so you base your sort of the philosophical dimensions of your work uh, around the particular theories or concepts. Um, there's the idea of uh, uh, using theories directly, so sort of applying them directly, comparing ideas, contrasting them, critiquing a particular claim or whatever, providing context for um, background stuff or um, for what you the, the the area of interest in your work, and also um, what you might call building theories. So that could be taking existing theories and refining them, building them, writing new theories from scratch. Uh, synthesizing ideas together which is quite common if you think there's something just missing from one idea and you want to add something from somewhere else. Um, so um, so yeah we try to expand um, a bit on Passy's idea to uh, to sort of show the range of possibilities with theories. Um, another idea that we have in the guide is that you can deconstruct a conceptual framework and um, uh, Jabberin offers this post-structuralist account of concepts as something, you know, historically contingent and um, open to sort of deconstruction. Um, and here the idea is that a conceptual framework is nothing more than a sort of collection of linked ideas. And it's always going to be a particular interpretation from a particular standpoint. Um, and in a true sort of deconstructive style, there's an emphasis here on the idea of texts and um, how texts have kind of, if you like, a sort of secret history and um, they, that can be explored. And so conceptual frameworks themselves can be kind of broken down and explored and the links between them kind of uh, deconstructed and reconstructed. And there's a series of, I think it's something like eight steps that they recommend for going through this process. And so it's a very qualitative um, way to look at it. And indeed, Jabberin recommends conceptual frameworks for qualitative purposes only. So the idea is that you would use uh, this process to try and sort of understand better the qualitative aspects of a particular um, set of concepts. Um, at the other end of the scale, a more quantitative uh, way of looking at this 
is to um, start off with the idea of um, analyzing, for instance, citations, something quantitative, uh, understanding a network or a social network. And the idea here is that you could, that rather than sort of looking at it from um, a sort of semantic point of view, you start purely with a sort of data-led um, approach. Um, so here we have a timeline visualization uh, network diagram from uh, Aris Bozkot's work. Um, pulling out metrics, letting them tell a story about um, which concepts relate to each other, which ideas uh, have associations and connections. And so this can be another way to um, approach the idea of a conceptual framework. Um, Perhaps it's something that also is useful to sort of triangulate as well. So you have the quantitative story, and then you also have um, the kind of more human level account for how these ideas interact. But it's definitely um, another kind of element in the toolkit, which can be quite useful. Um, but I think the, the sort of higher level point around that is that there are both very sort of quali qualitative and quantitative approaches within this stuff. And that's all, you know, totally fine. It's um, it's well within the kind of parameters of doing this work. Do you want to say briefly about whether you think um, you should create a new framework or share or, or use an existing one? Um, lots of people think they have to create a new one so they can be original in their work. Um, but most of the time, um, there's already plenty of frameworks out there that are pretty good and pretty well suited to whatever purposes you might have. Um, so there's no general rule with this, but I, I, I think generally, if you don't have to uh, reinvent a completely new framework, it's probably better not to, um, and, or to make changes minimal if you're gonna make changes to an existing one. But the really key thing is that it aligns to the question that you've got and the kind of data that you'll be able to collect. So um, I said a bit about what happens sort of through the research process. Um, so one view that we have in the guide uh, from Lesham and Trappard here is that the real benefit of doing um, conceptual frameworks uh, as part of research is that it's going to focus your mind essentially. And so you'll end up with more explicit definitions of what you're doing. Um, and so that could be making explicit how different theories relate to each other, um, uh, being able to kind of articulate some of the depth of these different theories that are influencing your research, um, being able to reconstruct your decision-making process and why you did certain things at certain times and how it all relates. And I think this idea of um, uh, the sort of holistic approach being informed by a conceptual framework is very much within the sort of first type of um, perspective on this, where the conceptual framework is the organizing principle. It's the roadmap for how it all fits together. And um, uh, in a way, it's your conception of the project, right? And what you're doing. Um, but it's also, um, there's also an idea here that this is the sort of higher level stuff, right? This, this is the stuff that, you know, people are coming into a PhD or an EdD and they probably haven't done a lot of work with conceptual frameworks. It's not something, you know, I necessarily hear a lot of people talking about um, as opposed to research methods, which is, you know, much more common to discuss. So, um, so one idea that comes up is that it's the distinctive challenge of doctoral research, right? So not just, you don't even have to have a chapter about it in your PhD, but to, this is the distinctive thing about doctoral research. It's being able to select and use a, a conceptual framework in the right way. Um, so one thing um, we tried to do was to sort of show when is a conceptual framework uh, applicable to a, to a piece of research. And you could, you know, you might draw this matrix a different way. Um, but where there's a stamp, the idea is that that's something that a conceptual framework can contribute to that stage of research. So stages run down on the left-hand side. Um, so in terms of just you know briefly describing what's happening at any point in the research process, your conceptual framework, conceptual framework should be helping you to do that. And similarly, it should be helping you to guide your decision-making process as you go through the um, 
the research process. And then at different points, it might be more or less relevant, like it's probably more relevant to, to framing stuff and interpreting your results um, and kind of coming up and refining a research question and that kind of thing. It might not be that relevant through the process of data collection, for instance, because that's kind of the, you know, if you like, the point where you've already decided how to, you know, what you're going to collect, you're just getting on with it. Um, but you might draw this matrix a bit differently, and that would be fine because things can be different for different people's projects and, and different frameworks. But I think it's interesting to think about it this way, this way, rather than, well, I've done my literature review and I did some stuff about conceptual frameworks in there. So now I'm just going to file that. I'm not going to think about that anymore. Um, there's a case for sort of taking time to choose one, but also being willing to tweak it and improve it as you go through the process as well. Um, so uh, this idea of um, the conceptual frameworks being the sort of distinctive thing about um, uh, doctoral education um, comes up um, in Lesham and Trafford, um, where they say, actually, this is really what a viva is all about. It's about whether you are able to sort of metacognize what's been happening to you um, and what's what's been going on in your work and how you've been thinking about it, how your thinking moves on as you reflect and as you sort of develop your ability as a researcher. Um, so this is, you know, I think quite an interesting idea. Um, and in some ways it's a sort of implied idea. Um, so we've, we've adapted um, a graphic from one of uh, the, their papers to sort of illustrate this where the more, the more doctorateness you're getting, the more you're sort of pushing your work up to that meta level, up to the conceptual level, and getting it away from the sort of very sort of quotidian stuff where I'm, this is my data and it says this, it describes this. When you're doing um, conceptual frameworks well, you're making those sort of higher order connections between different ideas, and you're seeing how different um, aspects of your work actually connect to broader context. Um, and maybe also a bit of self uh, criticism as well, you know, reflecting on how you could improve what you're doing on, where is your thinking a little bit woolly and where could it be clearer and that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, I thought that was quite an interesting um, uh, way of looking at things. So, so there's much more detail um, in the guide itself on all of the stuff that I was just talking about and all the references are in the guide as well. So I just want to move on and tell you a bit more about what's in the in the uh, guide itself. Um, so we were led by members who responded to our call in terms of um, what frameworks we should include. And so we focused on ones that were actually being used by people uh, within the network. And so for each of these, I won't necessarily go through them all and read them out because um, there's quite a few of them, I think 30. Uh, for each of these, we've got some sort of brief descriptions about what's going on in uh, this idea, this, con this concept or this framework. Um, then we've also uh, tried to collect and match it up with testimony from a, a member about um, their experience of using that particular framework. So you can see there's a range of different stuff here. Um, some of it's very sort of learning focused. Um, some of it's more sort of uh, uh, open education focus like MOOCs or OER. Um, we've got some um, very sort of specific frameworks like the TPAC framework or the UTAUT, where it's for a very specific purpose um, that it's been developed and someone's, you know, applying it. And some of it's very broad, like connectivism, you know, very sort of big idea stuff. So, um, and we also have the sort of social justice and equity uh, aspect here. So, I think there's quite a good range of stuff and quite a good range of things being covered that are of interest to people in the network. Um, I was also able to include something that I found it's on a CC BY license. Um, now, uh, these are briefer descriptions and they don't have the connection with open education as explicitly all the time. Um, but I thought there were some interesting, um, very brief descriptions of these things with a few references. So I've also included those. So there's some, there's a cluster around learner transitions, a uh, cluster on identity development and selfhood, one on pedagogies, 
one on curricula, um, one about theories of learning, uh, one about uh, theories of power, um, one of, on decolonization or post-colonialism, and one on uh, mobilities. And these are from um, internationalization of higher education. Um, but I think there's quite a lot of overlap and quite a lot of areas where people you know, have this interest. And as it's openly licensed, it was very easy to include it. So um, I want to take the opportunity to uh, say, give my sincere thanks to everyone who contributed. Um, lots of people chipped in, especially in the editing process. Very grateful to you for taking the time. Um, no one necessarily wants to correct all the errors that I put in the document, so many thanks. Um, I won't read everyone's name out because again, there's there's so many, there's 20 of them. Um, and I think it would be better to um, use the time that we have for a bit of discussion. But thank you very much. Um, and so before we just move on to that, I just want to say a couple of bits about um, the plans that we have for future publications. So um, we're currently September 21, we're publishing the Conceptual Frameworks Guide today. Um, in November, we will publish our research review for 2021. We've currently got uh, papers out with the reviewers. Um, we have our annual review coming up in December. So for next year, um, what we want to do is another round of the research review and then we'll probably do second editions of both the Research Methods Handbook and the Conceptual Frameworks Guide, just to give people more of a chance to contribute, because they, if they couldn't manage it in the, on, the, on the cycle we were in for these previously, or they feel more confident at this point, or even just seeing the final product makes it easier for people to um, add their contribution. Um, and we're also thinking about, um, combining those second editions, plus the three years worth of research reviews and some other um, uh, different bits that are on open licenses uh, from instance for the, from the OAR Hub project, where we've written resources about open research, for instance, and that could be integrated um, and just doing a sort of bumper book with everything in it to mark the end of this uh, phase of GoGN. So, um, that's exciting. If you have any ideas that relate to that, then we'd be um, happy to hear them. But that's our sort of roadmap towards uh, the end of this phase of uh, the project in terms of uh, research and publications. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, uh, I'm quite happy to have a discussion about the Cathedral Frameworks Guide or anything else um, that we've been uh, going through today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, that was fantastic. And um, as Rob says, over to uh, everyone now for comment and contribution, please um, just take, nice. yeah. So if you'd like to raise your hand, if you've got a question or comment and we can unmute you um, to contribute and welcome to people that have joined the call as well through the session. Oops. We have will be set up correctly. Just because everyone's being shy, I'll ask a <laughs> question, shall I, Rob? Um, yeah, and, and, and I sort of know the answers because you and I have been discussing it, but it might be interesting to pull out. I think. Um, uh, it's interesting. In fact, I think you you sort of said something about the the methodology framework handbook, um, which also another wonderful GoGen production. I think was in some ways more clearly defined. Sorry, it did say MJW five. It's Martin. Um, 
<laughs> I actually don't know why I locked him with that. Um, yeah, so the methodology handbook was uh, kind of more clearly defined. So I wonder if you just want to talk about kind of how the conceptual framework felt different to that in a way, you know, kind of in, in terms of drawing those boundaries about what it was, what, what, what was included and what wasn't. You touched upon this bit at the start. But. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for me, I was definitely less in my comfort zone with conceptual frameworks because, believe me, doing philosophy and getting to the end of a PhD, no one ever said, what's your conceptual framework? Just never heard that phrase, really. Um, it's much more common in education research and in sort of inter interdisciplinary research and stuff like that. Um, but when you hear conceptual framework, it's easy to sort of assume what you, you know what that is. Um, but it is a very ambiguous um, term and it is a very sort of like loosely applied term. Um, I would describe the conceptual framework guide uh, as sort of like the difficult second album after the uh, research methods handbook was very well received. Um, but it was also much more kind of uh, clearly defined and we had more ideas to kind of put in it. Um, so I, I felt like I learned more <laughs> doing this one, if you like. Um, and certainly like I hadn't really considered um, anything more than kind of um, the sort of the basics around it. And I thought we'd be mostly talking, you know, I thought it'd be, it would end up looking mostly like an encyclopedia of different, you know, methods that people had used. Um, but then the more you look into it, you can kind of start to, because there isn't that much written around it, you can start to summarize how it all kind of fits together, or at least you can't be, you can't be prescriptive about it either, because it's very, um, it's very particular to a particular project. Uh, particular context that framework might work in that you know in that in that um in that way so um so yeah i think trying to find the balance between helping people see it the right way and not being prescriptive about it that was the, the main thing to me um but um also even just reading about other other people's conceptual frameworks i think is really interesting and just um how people interpret things a little bit differently to you or they see the value in a different way to you um so i think yeah i think doing more of this kind of sharing is is good and i would i would sort of like to see it more normalized in a research paper to say we tried this concept but it didn't work so we, we tweaked it in this way sometimes people say that or they say we we, we synthesize the you know these frameworks or whatever but um but that that more kind of practical level of like this didn't work or is hard to work with this, you know, um, the kind of comments that a referee would probably make you take out, basically. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Rob. I think we had a question um, from Glenda. Did you have a comment, Glenda? I'm just going to unmute you again. Hi. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you very much for all these amazing contributions. But I also wanted to say to Rob, you, you're making international collaborative writing look easy. Um, and it's more of an observation than anything else, but I've just been sort of um, researching and thinking about you know, collaboration and open education. And I know from the GoGN perspective, you really want to put um, research out in the open and be open researchers. And yeah, I mean, I don't want to drop you with anything, but I mean, there must be challenges surely involved in this because you're making it look simple and you're managing to keep people's voices as well. So, you know, reading through some of the descriptions, it's, it's, such, a, um, it's such a rich story that's being told. And so interesting that we've got people from all over the world um, who have different styles of, of, of doing research and work, and yet it's all worked together. So it's a compliment, but also just if you could just reflect a little bit on the complexities of, of the sort of international writing. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Glenda. Um, yeah, so um, part of what we're exploring with GoGN is do open practices work in research? You know, can you build a, a community that sort of operates around the, the idea of sharing and, and openness and sort of supporting people in that way? Um, I think the answer is yes, you can. Um, 
And I think, um, I think partly it's because we're not coming out of a void with this stuff, right? We've been, we've been, the OU team's been uh, running GoGen for a few years now. And that's, that's a few years of meeting with people, discussing their work with them and trying to sort of understand what the kind of sort of consistent obstacles might be and the kind of things people run up against. So um, that's a good basis for doing this kind of work. But it's also, I think it's about trust. I think people trust GoGN and they trust that we're, you know, trying to help people basically and we're trying to support each other. And that counts for a lot because sometimes what you're asking people to do is bear their soul a little bit about what's, what's you know, working and not working in their research. Oh yeah, and then we're going to put it in, in an open license somewhere for you know we're just going to publish that. So there, yeah, not everyone wants to do that, and um, that's fair enough. Um, but I think where we can get people to do that, and where we can kind of um, share um, the inside story of our research, I think that adds a lot of value, and it also kind of helps us to be more open. As a, as a habit rather than something that you have to consciously, you know, force yourself to do or you don't feel comfortable doing and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I think there's maybe also something around giving people the space to just sort of express themselves. Sometimes when um, people want to collect data, they do it in a very tedious way, right? And um, we try to, only ask a handful of questions, but give people the space to actually just sort of tell it, tell it from their point of view. And then that gives you the sort of text that is useful for um, putting into a document like this, because you've actually already got, here's someone's own voice, this is what they say, and then we'll just use that, right? Well, and so I guess there's maybe a skill around writing around those kind of things, so they, they kind of join up, but. I mean, basically, it's it's um, twenty people's efforts being harmonised. I suppose is the is the the trick, but um, but yeah, it's it's very much kind of collective um, effort and a kind of network output. I would say. Thanks, Glenda. Thanks, Rob, and thanks everyone for the comments in the chat as well. I can see we've got a question from um, Jennifer. I don't know uh, if you wanted of. Uh, to uh, ask the question, Jennifer, I'm just going to unmute you. Um... Sure, I could do that. Hi, yes. everyone. Um, I, I was curious about, um, Rob, you had mentioned the use of conceptual frameworks were more common with qualitative research. And I, at this point, am looking like I'll be using mixed methods for my work. And I was curious if you came across um, anything about conceptual frameworks with with that approach? Um, well, it's not so much that conceptual frameworks are more qualitative. It's just that the the Jabberine, who's who was talking about sort of deconstructive approaches, ends up at a point where it's only really relevant to qualitative elements because um, it's all about you know the meaning of a text, right? You know, it's not something that, that you think he thinks could be understood in that way, um, sort of quantitatively. If if you're doing mixed methods, I mean, one one idea would be, well, you would do that sort of textual qualitative analysis in a literature review, but then include something like the network analysis, which is more quantitative, and then you basically just triangulate that, right? So you compare the two outputs, the same question. If you look at one from citation analysis and one from looking at the text themselves, then you've got a qualitative and a quantitative aspect, um, which I think you could make. But but it's not that that is itself. A, I mean, it's a kind of mixed method, but this would be done more at the stage of building your conceptual framework and you know putting all your pieces on the board. Um, but it could lead you to from there. It could lead you into a, a mixed methods um, approach. Um, but it's very difficult to be general because there's so many different sort of perambulations and possibilities with these things. And, you know, you can just add a new element to a conceptual framework and all of a sudden there's all this other stuff now comes into the picture. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's, yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult to say about your, you know, particular um, context. Um, 
but most of the time anyone who's combining any sort of numerical metrics with any sort of qualitative data is doing mixed methods you know so it's pretty common um, and a lot of the frameworks that are in the guide they are mixed methods essentially they have to be so um, I think it's always good to try and find other examples of where someone's used you know the same approach um, so you can see if it works for them or um, also um, you've got a point of comparison with whatever you find if you're using someone else's um, framework or approach or method or whatever so there can be a value in that but there can also be a value in creating your own which is very custom made for your particular uh, research project so it's difficult to be general unfortunately And I think also with the mixed method stuff, in some ways, that's more about research methods. So the other guide is the one for that. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Thanks, Rob. Um, I've got another question um, from uh, Safaraz in the chat. Um, and I'm not sure if you wanted to ask the question over uh, the mic or um, I can read that out. I'll, um, I'll enable you to unmute yourself if you would like to ask the question, otherwise I can read out from the chat box. Okay, so I think, um, hello, hi, I think we can hear you now. Yes, I can hear you. Hello, great, did you wanna ask a, Please go ahead and ask your Yeah, question. my question is in relation with the methodology framework. Most of the time I have seen the students have difficulty in terms of qualitative writing to, to, to give a open-ended or close-ended message in relation with their research. So how can we address that? Um, I think it's... Uh, interesting that people don't really get trained on this stuff at any point right um, yeah. I don't know what it's like where you are but um, no one was really talking about conceptual frameworks before a doctoral level and then it's like you're supposed to understand what a conceptual framework is um, I think with a lot of this stuff it's partly practice right and feedback and you know improving people's qualitative uh, writing um, Feedback is the obvious way to do it. Um, it's a bit labor intensive, I would say. Um, one, one way of looking at it though, is you could say, okay, just do it, do it, um, do it the way that Jabberine suggests and do a sort of deconstructive approach where there is no quantitative element to it. It's purely qualitative. Um, and maybe as an exercise, that would be an interesting thing to explore to get people to just do qualitative stuff, just do very detailed um, deconstruction of ideas and, and concepts. Again, it is a skill in itself, right? People do learn how to do that. But even just having a go at that and developing a sensitivity to the qualitative aspects, you know, it's worth a try, I think. But it's a good question. Where do you learn this stuff? Uh, that's great. Uh, I have seen a number of times, well, the many students that are turning back and they say uh, their language isn't up to that level, whereas you are labeled as a scholarly writing style. As you uh, suggested now, that it's an intensive labor work, intensive thought processing and keep, uh, keep on working on those lines where your lines are, where your messages try to be brushed up and clearly understand to others. Yeah, I think um, I think it is one where practice and feedback is really what it's all about. But I appreciate the language side is yeah, definitely not easy. Um, but any any theory stuff as well, which is quite heavy on jargon and specialist vocabulary, it's not very accessible, whereas numbers are numbers, right? So there's definitely you know, it's definitely less accessible to people who English is not their native language, 
to get to engage with these sorts of frameworks. I think that's true. Yeah, thank you very much. That, that's that's really great to help. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, that's fantastic. I'm just conscious of time. We're coming up to the hour now. Um, so I think it's probably just time for a final um, comment or question from anyone. Um, if you'd like to ask in the chat box so I can unmute you as well, then um, please let me know and I'll do that. Um, but it's been really fantastic. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for the discussion so far. It's been really great. So I'll just pause a moment um, in case anyone wanted to share any further reflections or thoughts. Have we put the link? I think the link is um, the link to the report. Do we have that to hand, Rob, just to pop that in the chat, actually? Uh, yeah, one sec. That's great. Thanks, Martin. Oh, and thanks, Kane, for your kind words. That's Wonderful. So, yeah, you should be able to see the link in the chat. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always leave you a... Uh... So, yeah. So, it looks like um, if there's no more questions or... Uh, um, contributions from everyone. Um, just to, to say a really big thank you to Rob <laughs> for uh, his presentation today and um, for everyone for joining us.